today topic of discussion is the lipogenesis as we know very well that from the word lipogenesis means the synthesis of lipids this is the synthesis of lipids uh, in which the lipids they are synthesized in a de novo way okay so uh, first of all we must know about the location of this lipogenesis where does this lipogenesis take place okay so the lipogenesis usually it takes place number one majorly in the liver number two in the lactating mammary glands in lactating mammary glands and to a very lesser extent in adipose tissues okay so uh, this lipogenesis this process will take place in liver as well as in lactating mammary glands as well as in the adipose tissues second what are the precursors what are the substances or the molecules that are that are required for the de novo synthesis of this lipids the substances which are required for de novo synthesis number 1 acetyl CoA because we are going to incorporate the carbons of this acetyl CoA in the synthesizing new uh, chain of the uh, of the fatty acids of the lipids as well as melonyl CoA this one is also very significant very important and NADPH2 as in my previous lectures i have already told you that nadph2 the difference between nadph2 as well as the difference between the nadh2 nadh2 that was nadh2 that was the electron carrier for the energy purposes but this nadph2 it is the electron carrier for the reductive biosynthetic processes and definitely most important for of all of these is the enzyme which is the fatty acid synthesis synthesis so these are the precursors which are required for the uh, lipogenesis for the lipid de novo synthesis of the lipids okay now this acetyl coa this is usually that we get after the glycol glycolytic aerobic glycolytic pathway but what about this melonyl coa first of all we have to get this melonyl coa in nadph2 and after getting these two substances fatty acid synthase will convert these molecules or uh, we can say that it, the fatty acid synthase it will incorporate the carbons of these molecules in the synthesis of lipids in the growing fatty acid chains now the next thing is which is very important in what conditions this lipogenesis will take place what are the major factors for the synthesis of lipids number 1 very important whenever the person is in hyperglycemic phase if anybody is in hyperglycemic phase it means the lipogenesis will start high carbohydrate or high diet high calorie into intake and insulin these are the factors which are responsible for the lipogenesis which are responsible for the lipogenesis now let's start the pathway of this fatty acid synthesis of the lipogenesis first of all as i have told you that we must have to get the melonyl coa and nadph2 so first we will get the melonyl coa in nadph2 after that fatty acid synthase will become active and incorporate the carbons of these molecules into the growing fatty acid chains for example here is the blood vessel this is the blood vessel and in the blood vessel we have the glucose molecules okay these glucose molecules with the help of transporters they will enter into the hepatocytes let's say this is the larger hepatocyte and here we have the mitochondria of the hepatocyte okay in the liver 
and here when these glucose molecules because of higher concentration and uh, because of insulin when they get enter into the uh, hepatocyte there will be a glycolytic pathway and as a result th that is a multiple reaction pathway multiple step pathway as a result of this pathway this pyruvate th this uh, glucose it will be converted into the pyruvate okay this pyruvate now it will get entry into the here into the mitochondria with the help of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex this pyruvate is a three carbon compound this is a three carbon compound and here one carbon will be eliminated as a co2 and the enzyme which is working over here that is the pdh complex that we name as pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and after this this pyruvate will be converted into the acetyl coa it will be converted into the acetyl coa now this acetyl coa is a two carbon compound okay now what's what happened that as a result of this when acetyl coa comes into the mitochondria there starts the krebs cycle now let's here we have already we have the oxaloacetic acid and this will form the citrate this acetyl coa and oxaloacetic acid which is a four carbon compound it is a two carbon compound when both of these combine together they condense together they form a six carbon compound that we name as isocitrate now this isocitrate is usually it is converted into the this citrate is usually converted into the isocitrate once again listen to me what happened that acetyl coa that combines with the oxaloacetate and forms the citrate and form the citrate as a result after this the citrate will be converted into the isocitrate into the isocitrate now this isocitrate will be converted into the alpha ketoglutarate which will be converted into the uh, succinyl coa and so on the reaction will continue until unless oxaloacetate is again formed so this is the tca cycle this is what this is the tca cycle now where comes the turning point when the levels of atp in the cell they rises enough when the here the enzyme is usually uh, here the enzyme is isocitrate dehydrogenase let me write it isocitrate dehydrogenase okay this is the enzyme now when the levels of atp that rises enough atp levels they rises enough what they will do they will simply inhibit the isocitrate dehydrogenase okay when the isocitrate dehydrogenase is inhibited this isocitrate will not convert itself into the alpha ketoglutarate and as a result the levels of this isocitrate they will also rise and as we know that this is a reversible reaction isocitrate when the levels of isocitrate they increases that will start converting back into the citrate and as a result levels of citrate will rise enough when the levels of citrate that rises enough this citrate will start moving out of the mitochondria start moving out of the mitochondria like this it will go out okay now once again listen to me what i have told you that first the glucose comes 
okay in the in the blood from the blood glucose enters into the hepatocyte and there takes place the glycolysis here let me write as a result of this glycolysis the uh, glucose is converted into the pyruvate this pyruvate it cannot cross inner mitochondrial membrane so with the help of pth complex this CO2 will be eliminated and pyruvate will be converted into the acetyl CoA. As a result, when acetyl CoA is formed, synthesized, this acetyl CoA now it will condense with the oxaloacetate and form the citrate. The reaction will go on to complete the TCA cycle. But when the ATP levels in the cell that rises enough, that ATP will inhibit the isocitrate dehydrogenase number one. And the isocitrate dehydrogenase, when it is inhibited, it will not convert the isocitrate into the alpha ketoglutarate. Okay. As a result, the isocitrate levels they will also rise. And this is a reversible reaction. Isocitrate will be converted back into the citrate. Now the levels of citrate they are enough. They are they they are elevated enough that this citrate will go out because in the mitochondria we have the citrate shuttle we have the citrate transporter so that's why the citrate is uh, moving out of the mitochondria into the cytosol why it's moving out into the cytosol because this lipogenesis this is a cytosolic process this lipogenesis is a cytosolic process and enzymes of the cytosol they are the enzymes of lipogenesis they are present in the cytosol so here we can see that this citrate and atp these are the signals which indicate or which trigger the lipogenesis okay these are the signals of lipogenesis is this clear to you and the secondly uh, we can we can also uh, say that the second reason we can also uh, say that whenever the more and more glucose is being converted into the pyruvate more and more acetyl coa is being formed and the when the levels of acetyl coa these becomes enough or these exceed the capacity of the tca cycle then these acetyl coa with the oxaloacetate these will start converting into the citrate and citrate will uh, will start going out into the cytosol so in two ways we can explain this mechanism number one is when the process was taking place okay the higher levels of atp that will inhibit the isocitrate dehydrogenase number one okay and as a result the levels of isocitrate will increase and citrate levels will increase and citrate when the citrate levels are enough it will move out secondly when more and more glucose is coming this acetyl coa is being converted into citrate with the help of oxaloacetate and this concentration of acetyl coa it will exceed the formation of acetyl coa concentration will exceed the levels of or the capacity of tca cycle and as a result as a result this citrate will go out into the cytosol now into the cytosol there is already present here the enzyme acetyl coa and oxaloacetate the enzyme to convert these substances is the citrate synthase enzyme is a citrate synthase enzyme and when these molecules are combined together there will be the L, uh, removal of coa okay now with the help of another enzyme which is already present in the cytosol that becomes active when the citrate comes out that enzyme is called citrate ligase what it will do it will do it will split this molecule into two parts as you can see when this molecule will come it will split this citrate into two parts because citrate was a condensed molecule of acetyl coa and oxaloacetate so here we will have acetyl coa as well as the oxaloacetate okay and here the atp will be used number one atp is being use number two coa will be incorporated coa will be incorporated 
okay and what the end products we have we have the acetyl coa we have acetyl coa as well as we have oxaloacetate now let's first discuss about the oxaloacetate and then about the acetyl coa so this oxaloacetate it is converted into the malate with the help of malate dehydrogenase enzyme number 1 it is converted into malate here any dph it will be used okay any dh2 sorry not ph2 any dh2 is used and as a result we will have nad positive now from where we are getting this NADH2 and the enzyme is malate dehydrogenase definitely. Malate dehydrogenase enzyme. From where we are getting this NADH2? We are getting this NADH2 from the cytos from the glycolytic pathway. From the glycolytic pathway okay from where we are getting this we are getting this from the glycolytic pathway okay next this malate will be converted into this malate will be converted into the pyruvate with the help of malic enzyme with the help of malic enzyme and here the body will synthesize the NADPH2 the body will synthesize NAD positive and here we have NADPH2 so as I have told you that first we have to form the melanyl coa and nadph2 here we are getting the nadph2 one molecule of nadph2 so this is we can say that this is the source of nadph2 and what is the others what can be the other source of nadph2 the other source of nadph2 that can be hmp shunt pathway that can be hmp shunt pathway as a result of this hmp shunt we get nadph2 okay so as a whole we can see that we get total two molecules of nadph2 from the one glucose and one hmp shunt pathway okay so this is the first the the, the source of nadph2 is the oxaloacetate when the oxaloacetate is converted into the malate and this malate is converted into the pyruvate with the help of malic enzyme so that's why this malic enzyme is very important and this malic enzyme as a result of this conversion we will have the nadph2 and secondly we get this nadph2 from the hmp shunt now the body is going to use this nadph2 in future in the lipid in the fatty acid chain synthesis in the lipid synthesis is that clear to you now now what about this acetyl coa this acetyl CoA it is converted into the malonyl CoA with the help of an other important enzyme that we name as acetyl CoA carboxylase. Let's discuss over here. For example, here we have acetyl CoA. Here we have the enzyme. This is enzyme. <laughs> this is enzyme that we name as acetyl CoA carboxylase as its name indicating that this acetyl coa carboxylase it will incorpor incorporate the one molecule of co2 so 
it will incorporate the one molecule of CO2 and definitely this enzyme needs a coenzyme and the coenzyme for this enzyme is biotin. The coenzyme for this is the biotin. Okay, so with the help of biotin, this acetyl CoA carboxylase it will become active and it will incorporate the CO2 into the acetyl CoA. This acetyl CoA is a two carbon compound, and as a result, when the CO2 is incorporated into this, we will get a three carbon compound that is named as malonyl CoA. So as a result of this whole pathway, we have got our malonyl CoA that was obtained from the acetyl CoA. So there must be the acetyl CoA to form the malonyl CoA. And second, we got the NADPH2. This NADPH2 was obtained from the oxaloacetate conversion into the pyruvate to the malic enzyme as well as from the HMP shunt. Now the next one is the fatty acid synthase. This fatty acid synthase now it will start incorporating these carbons together and will start synthesizing the fatty acids. Now very important thing about this enzyme. This acetyl CoA carboxylase, this is this one is considered as the rate limiting or the regulatory step. So here can be the regulation of this enzyme can be in two ways. Okay, so its regulation can be if we talk about <laughs> If we talk about the regulation of this acetyl CoA carboxylase enzyme, so first of all, before going to discuss the regulation, you must know about the acetyl CoA carboxylase, what it is. This acetyl CoA carboxylase is a protomeric molecule which is usually the present in the phosphorylated form and inactive form. Okay, whenever it is present in phosphorylated form, in active form, the body has to polymerize it, has to dephosphorylate it and to make it active. For example, here is our enzyme. which looks very sad because it is phosphorylated. This in line, if I show you over here, this is usually present in this format, in the form of protomers. In the form of protomers are dimers, in the form of dimers. When this will become active, it will be polymerized like this. When this enzyme is polymerized, it will become active. It will become active. Is this clear to you? Is this clear to you? So in the same way, once again listen to me very carefully that what I have told you that acetyl CoA carboxylase is the enzyme which is at the uh, going to regulate this step which is going to regulate the lipid senses lipogenesis okay so that's why this step is a regulatory step it this step is the rate limiting step this is the rate limiting step this is a rate limiting step now how it is being regulated First of all, this acetyl CoA carboxylase, it is usually present in inactive form in the form of protomers or dimers. Okay, so when it is present in the form of uh, protomers or dimers, body polymerizes these molecules and we get the active form. One thing. Secondly, whenever it is present in the protomer or, dim uh, protomer or dimeric form, it is phosphorylated. So we can say that phosphorylated form of acetyl CoA carboxylase is the inactive form when it is polymerized it is dephosphorylated now it becomes active so we can say there must be the two features in the acetyl coir acetyl coir carboxylase number one it must be in heteromeric or uh, in the form of protomeric or dimeric form number two it must be phosphorylated when it has to become active 
it should be polymerized it should be polymerized number two it should be dephosphorylated then this enzyme will become active and will incorporate the carbon dioxide into the malonyl coa now we were discussing about the regulation of this enzyme because it is a regulatory step there can be two types of regulations short term regulation and long term regulation here first i will explain you about the short term regulation okay for example what i am going to explain you is i am going to explain you the short term regulation okay i'm going to explain you about the short term regulation in the short term regulation there can be two pathways the allosteric regulation as well as the hormonal regulation allosteric regulation as well as the hormonal regulation so we can say that this short term regulation can be allosteric or can be the hormonal okay let's first discuss about the allosteric regulation in the allosteric regulation two factors are very important number one is the uh, usually citrate concentrations and number two is a fatty acid concentration when this i have told you that when it is the phosphorylated form it is usually the uh, it is inactive when it is in the form of uh, dephosphorylate dephosphorylation it is usually the active let me show you here now it's smiling okay so here is the phosphorylated form here is the dephosphorylated form this is inactive form this is the active form okay there are as i've told you two factors number one is the allosteric and hormonal in the allosteric regulation it can be positive regulation or the negative regulation it can be the positive regulation or the negative regulation so allosterically we can say that the citrate concentrations citrate concentrations these play a positive role these positively regulate the uh, acetyl coa carboxylase okay and if we talk about the fatty acids these fatty acids they negatively regulate this how whenever the citrate levels are higher this enzyme will become active whenever the fatty acid levels are higher it will inhibit this enzyme and make it inactive and will make it inactive okay so this is the way uh, how the allosterically this enzyme is being regulated and if we if we talk about the hormonal regulation in the hormonal regulation we have two kinds of hormone three kinds of basically hormones number one is the uh, uh, insulin number two is the glucagon epinephrine and cortisol the glucagon epinephrine and cortisol these basically these play a role in negative regulation okay these will inhibit this enzyme and the insulin that will cause the activation of this enzyme how let's Uh, have a look over here for example here we have the insulin this is the receptor okay this is our receptor and here comes the insulin when insulin receptor with one pass receptor it will activate the protein phosphatases through a signaling cascade it will activate which 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 enzyme or which protein the protein phosphatases it will activate the protein phosphatases and what this protein phosphatase will do it will simply remove the phosphate from this enzyme when the phosphate is removed from this enzyme this enzyme will become active 
this will become active secondly if we talk about the insulin uh, if we talk about the glucagon and epinephrine and cortisol what they do basically they do the phosphorylation of this enzyme and again it is converted back into the phosphorylated form and inactive form let's uh, have a look over here for example again we have a receptor here comes the insulin okay oh sorry here comes the glucagon or epinephrine or the uh, cortisol it will activate the further it will activate g protein and this g protein will cause the formation of cyclic amp and this cyclic amp will lead toward the synthesis of pkc molecules protein kinases and these protein kinases what they will do they will simply phosphorylate this they will simply phosphorylate this and convert this inactive form into the inactive form active form into the inactive form so this is the way how the hormones they regulate the uh, acetyl coa carboxylase activation as well as the inactivation once again uh, let's have a recap let's have a look i've told you that acetyl coa this is converted into the malonyl coa with the help of enzyme acetyl coa carboxylase right acetyl coa carboxylase it is regulated in two ways short term regulation and the long term regulation that i will explain uh, next in short term regulation it can be regulated allosterically or hormonally okay in the allosteric regulation there are two factors the citrate as well as the fatty acid citrate cause the activation of this whenever the levels of citrates are higher whenever the levels of citrate are higher it will cause the activation of this enzyme acetyl coa carboxylase that is a dimeric or protomeric enzyme and it becomes polymerized okay now it's active number 2 whenever the levels of fatty acids in the body that in the cell they are higher they will inhibit this enzyme and will convert this in, into inactive form and if we talk about the hormonally we have three kind four kinds of hormones insulin glucagon epinephrine and cortisol here the blue one this is the insulin blue one is a insulin okay so when insulin comes the insulin through a one pass receptor activate the protein phosphatases and these protein phosphatases these will dephosphorylate this acetyl coa carboxylase when it is dephosphorylated it will become active and will start converting this acetyl coa into the malonyl coa and secondly when comes the glucagon the epinephrine the cortisol they activate the g protein coupled receptor and this g protein coupled receptor will form the g cyclic amp and this cyclic amp will go to the activate and activate the pkc molecule this pkc molecule will phosphorylate this form and when it will phosphorylate this form it will become inactive the sad expression is that clear to you so this is the short term regulation and if we talk about the long term regulation if we talk about the long term regulation number 1 for the long term regulation which is very important high carbohydrate diet high calorie intake high calorie intake okay and whenever we are on low carbohydrate intake more lipid diet it will inhibit this pathway so whenever we are in on prolonged starvation it means uh, we are uh, we, we are on uh, whenever our body is on prolonged starvation it means which means we are becoming deficient with energy in that case is in the prolonged starvation our our this process will be inhibited it will inhibit this enzyme and the lipogenesis will stop but whenever we are taking high carbohydrate intake continuously for the longer time periods that will cause the activation of this enzyme and will start converting the malonyl coa and which will ultimately go to the fatty acid synthase enzyme and there will be the synthesis of fatty acids 
is that clear to you this was all about the lipogenesis now let's have a uh, recap on all of this process lipogenesis means the synthesis of lipids this is the cytosolic process number one number two if we talk about the location it takes place in liver lactating mammary lactating mammary glands as well as to a lesser extent in the adipose tissues now what are the precursors for this the precursors for this are the acetyl coa malonyl coa nadph2 fatty acid synthase now first we will discuss about the acetyl coa then about the nadph2 then about the malonyl coa let's have a look over here here we have the glucose in our blood this glucose enters into the cytosol of the hepatocyte and here it is converted into the pyruvate through the glycolysis. Pyruvate is a 3 carbon compound which is converted into the acetyl CoA which is a 2 carbon compound with the help of PDH complex. Now this acetyl CoA is converted into the citrate with the help of oxaloacetate. Whenever the levels of ATP that rises enough they, they will inhibit the isocitrate dehydrogenase as a result the levels of isocitrate will increase and this is a reversible process and this will form, this will favor the increased level of citrate that will go out and as it will go out, the citrate lies with the help of ATP and CoA as such, it will split this molecule and we will have the acetyl CoA and oxaloacetate. This oxaloacetate basically this is going to act as a source of NADPH2 which is the important uh, electron carrier for the reductive biosynthesis in lipids. This oxaloacetate, it will be converted into the malate with the help of uh, NAD positive formation. This NADH2 that comes from the glycolysis. This malate, this is converted into the pyruvate with the help of malic enzyme and this malic enzyme will form the NADPH2. It will form the NADPH2. Now this NADPH2 is going to act as a electron carrier for the directive biosynthesis in lipogenesis. Second one, second uh, lip NADPH2 that comes from the HMP shunt pathway. And what about this acetyl CoA? This acetyl CoA is converted into the malonyl CoA with the help of enzyme acetyl CoA carboxylase. This enzyme needs a coenzyme which is a biotin. It needs to incorporate the CO2 so that's why it will be able to convert this two carbon molecule into a three carbon compound that is a malonyl CoA. This malonyl CoA is going to fatty acids is now going to participate in the lipogenesis. Now this acetyl CoA carboxylase enzyme or this step is a rate limiting step it is a uh, regulatory step its regulation can be of two types the short term regulation and the long term regulation if we talk about the short term regulation th this can be further subdivided into two categories the allosteric regulation and the hormonal regulation in the allosteric regulation whenever the levels of citrates that rises whenever the levels of citrate that rises it will cause the activation of this enzyme acetyl coa carboxylase is a protomer a dimeric enzyme which will which is polymerized whenever it is active so this citrate is going to favor the polymerization of this enzyme and going to activate this enzyme but increased level of fatty acids these, these will inhibit the activation of this enzyme Secondly, we talk about the hormonal in the hormonal we have the insulin glucagon epinephrine cortisol Insulin will favor the activation of this acetyl CoA carboxylase while the glucagon, while the epinephrine and cortisol, they, those will favor the inactivation of this enzyme. When insulin comes, it becomes bind, it binds to the one pass receptor and activate the protein phosphatases. These protein phosphatases, these will dephosphorylate, these will dephosphorylate this enzyme and make it active here you can see the smiling face of this enzyme and when the insulin and glucagon comes this insulin and glucagon these will activate the g protein coupled receptor g protein coupled receptor will activate the cyclic amp which will in turn activate the pkc and this pkc will cause the phosphorylation of this enzyme and ultimately this enzyme will be converted into the inactive form so this is the short term regulation and if we talk about the long term regulation whenever a person is on a on a carbohydrate diet on a on a carbohydrate diet for a prolonged time periods that will favor the activation of this enzyme and the lipogenesis whenever the person is on starvation on high car on lipid diet or low uh, on, on high uh, high lipid diet or on starvation are suffering from low levels of glucose at that time this will favor the inactivation of this enzyme and will stop the lipogenesis so this was all about the lipogenesis the synth de novo lip, uh, fatty acid synthesis is that clear to you